So we want to keep on with the latest here from War on Israel and the Hamas hostage deal. We're joined by Dr. Alan Burstein. He's a visiting assistant professor at the University of California, Irvine. Alan, you're also a fellow at the Israel Institute. I appreciate you for joining us here at Live Now from Fox on this evening. I'd like you to tell our viewers a little more about the current hostage deal that's in place. So first of all, thank you for having me. The, um, the current hostage deal is supposed to see the release of a minimum of 50 Israeli women and children, and also some older women with, uh, that aren't there with their children, in exchange for 150 Palestinian prisoners that are held in Israeli jails, also specifically minors and women. That is supposed to happen over a four-day period in which there's going to be a pause in the war. Each day, Hamas is going to release several prisoners. It is unclear how many they're going to release. And in exchange, Israel is going to release Palestinian prisoners. And after that, according to the deal, Hamas can, quote-unquote, earn more days of pause if it releases upwards of 10 Israeli hostages each day. The deal also includes the entrance of specific aid and fuel and natural gas to the Gaza Strip and a cessation of Israeli flyovers in the Gaza Strip. But specifically, the most important thing for both sides is the release of Israeli hostages and the release of Palestinian prisoners, which is supposed to happen over this four-day period and possibly a few days later than that. Alan, this deal announced so recently, but already there's been changes to it, most notably the fact that it was delayed. Now hostages, they won't be released until Friday. Why is that? And is there a possibility that this delay could happen again? So the reports that are that the delay happened because of disagreement regarding the mechanism through which Israeli hostages will be released. Hamas is extremely scared that Israel is going to use this time in order to track the, its movement, in order to figure out where the hostages are being held, use this to later storm where the hostages are being held, possibly to assassinate leaders. And so they are trying to come up with all kinds of ways to, in which they will release the hostages in ways that Israel can't figure out where they are. The mechanisms were said to have been worked out, that Israel will not have any flyovers and not have any spy drones and neither will the United States, and that the hostages will be released to the Red Cross. The reports were that the whole deal was a done deal. Later, it was reported that Hamas actually has not signed off on the mechanism through which people will be released, and that this remains to be seen how Qatar is going to work this out. According to all the reports, this is a technical thing that can be worked out, but the situation is so volatile. It's so volatile, anything can go wrong at any given moment. Tonight it was reported that there was substantial artillery fighting of the IDF in the Han Yunus area. Now, one artillery goes wrong and targets a hospital or something like that, the deal breaks down and all hell breaks loose. So right now it seems like it's still going to happen, that it's just a technical delay, but in the volatile situation, every minute lost, is dangerous because unclear what could go wrong further on. Here on the screen, Alan, I do have a tweet of you uh, breaking the news about the delays in the Israel Hamas hostage deal. Now, you're talking about here that there's uh, so many concerns, of course, when negotiating with a terrorist organization. We're talking about here Hamas. Are there concerns that Hamas won't hold up its end of the deal? Now, we spoke to some other experts earlier this evening saying that there is no way that for sure Hamas is going to sign off on this, even though they haven't just yet. Hamas has a desperate need right now for this deal. They are desperate to have a couple of days of pause in the war in order to regroup. They expected Hezbollah to join the war with them, and Hezbollah has not thrown its full weight in the war, into the war by any means. Hamas did not expect Israel to retaliate so strongly. They desperately need a pause in the war. And in addition to that, they also desperately need the release of Palestinian prisoners in order to justify to the Palestinians why they did this. Why are they suffering so much? Well, look, they're showing some results. So that's why Hamas is actually ex accepting in this deal a lot less than it originally demanded for the release of women and children on October 8th. So Hamas has an interest in getting to the deal. In terms of the group living up to its word, as you said, when negotiating with a terror group, you can never really expect it to fully live up to its word. However, I will say that historically, when terror groups come to agreements about hostage release, 
usually they actually do live up to what they say, only after the deal is signed. And obviously they'll find ways to try to extend the pauses in the war and do all kinds of manipulations. But in general, and this is not just in the Middle East, when it comes to Boko Haram in Nigeria, when it comes to Abu Sayyaf in the Philippines, usually when terror organizations actually say we're going to release X amount of people in exchange for, if it's ransom, if it's prisoner release, they tend to do so primarily because they want more deals to continue. They want to show that at least in this, they're trustworthy once they sign. That's why to me it was, as you're showing my tweets, that's why to me it was very dismaying when I heard that the problem was that Hamas hasn't signed yet. The minute I heard that, I was like, oh, that's that makes my heart drop. Because if they sign, then they'll probably try to deliver. It depends how. If they haven't, as far as they're concerned, agreed yet, that makes me more worried in that moment. So we had a former Marine intelligence officer earlier today to talk about the same discussion that we're having here. And he had mentioned that Hamas is probably just trying to gather up all of the hostages. That they're a little disorganized, possibly on their end, uh, trying to make sure that they have what they need to make this deal hold up. But this is the first time that we're seeing something like this happen. Do you expect there to be another round of maybe hostage negotiations as this war continues? So first I'll say that I agree with that assessment. Um, Hamas, in my assessment, and I'm not a Marine intelligence officer, but I do study Hamas for a living. Um, I don't think that they had anticipated to succeed on October 7th nearly as much as they did. They had not planned to have such success. They thought the IDF would be waiting for them, as did the rest of the world. Um, and they would have not planned to take so many hostages. They had prepared facilities to hold hostages, not nearly as many. So I do actually believe that they don't know where everyone is. They hid them in different in different locations. They actually outsourced their, their security to different organizations, different people, because they weren't prepared for that. So I do agree with that assessment that they probably don't know where they are and are trying to locate them. In terms of do I think that there will be follow-up deals? Yes, I do. Um, but what has to be noted is that as far as Hamas and the Palestinian Islamic Jihad are concerned, there is a vast difference between the IDF soldiers that they are holding, which they kidnapped also a substantial amount, and the civilians that they kidnapped. As far as they're concerned, the civilians that they kidnapped can be exchanged for this quote unquote, not as lucrative deal for them. As far as Hamas is concerned, what they are getting in return here is the release of 150 women and minors in Israeli jail. I looked over the list today of the prisoners that are going to be released, the Palestinian prisoners. These are by no means high profile prisoners. Most of them, vast majority were arrested in the last year on charges of throwing stones, on charges of incitement. It's not Hamas showing, look, we managed to defeat Israel and bring back the top murderers, et cetera, et cetera. They're willing to exchange civilians in exchange for those types of Palestinian prisoners. But as far as both Palestinian Islamic Jihad and Hamas is concerned, the soldiers that they kidnapped, and they kidnapped some very high profile soldiers, including, I'm not sure what the highest rank is, but very high ranking. They, they're going to hold on to them only for a much larger prisoner exchange. When Hamas has historically kidnapped soldiers, like the Gilad Shalit incident, they kidnapped a soldier in 2006. In 2011, he was released in exchange for over 1,000 Palestinian prisoners. That is the framework of Hamas and the Palestinian Islamic Jihad C for releasing soldiers that they've kidnapped. So I think there might be future deals, but there's a vast difference between releasing civilian, Israeli civilians, and as far as Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad is concerned, what the price that they'll demand is for releasing soldiers that they have kidnapped. We're taking a live look out at Jerusalem very early in the morning on that side of the world as we continue this conversation. Alan, I do want to bring up this point because something that stuck out to me was the fact that Israel agreed to this four-day ceasefire. That's something that at the start of this war, the prime minister said he was not going to do because there's a fear that Hamas is going to have time to regroup. And you did just mention that this terrorist organization, they're desperate to have a pause when it comes to this fighting. Is there any possibility that this could backfire on Israel? Is there a chance that Hamas can really regain that much strength within four days? I doubt that Hamas can regain that much strength in order to really challenge the Israeli IDF. And we've seen this. Hamas's stronghold was the north of the Gaza Strip, it was Gaza City. And the IDF, through a campaign of massive, almost unprecedented bombardment, and the IDF has gathered up and called up from reserve duty, the largest army Israel has ever called up, 
has managed to take over the north of the Gaza Strip. So Hamas is not going to be able to regain its power in the sense that it will challenge the IDF. It is likely going to be able to regain some control over the territory in order to challenge the IDF because the stakes are different. As far as Israel is concerned, if Hamas manages to reposition and redeploy its people in such a way that it challenges the IDF as it moves down south, it won't be able to stop the IDF from taking over the southern parts of the Gaza Strip. But if it manages to now use these four days in order to create booby traps, create situations where all of a sudden 50 Israeli soldiers are killed, that unto itself will be a huge victory for Hamas and a huge blow to Israel. In the entire invasion of the Gaza Strip, Israel has lost less than 70 soldiers. For an Israeli mentality, an Israeli political system, the loss of soldiers in combat is very, very harsh, very severe, very demoralizing, such that Hamas, Hamas's regrouping does not necessarily mean that they will be able to amass an army in the next four days and actually stop Israel from taking over the southern parts of the Gaza Strip or retake parts of the north of the Gaza Strip. But it does mean that they may be able to reposition themselves. They've learned how the IDF is fighting in this round. And this is not unprecedented. In 2014, which is the last time Israel invaded the Gaza Strip, there was also a pause in the fighting in order to, for, at that time, it was to allow humanitarian aid to go in. There wasn't a situation of Israeli hostages. And eventually, that pause in the war was broke. Oh, sorry, was, that pause in the war was broken by Hamas. And the result was, as far as Israel was concerned, a catastrophe. The result was several soldiers were killed, and the body of one of those soldiers was kidnapped, and that body is still held by Hamas today, Hadar Goladin, that Israel is still trying to recover. So that is the greater fear of Hamas using these days to regain some strength. It's not that they'll be able to reamass their army, because as you said, they're unlikely to be able to use those four days to just all of a sudden come back and fight the IDF in a way that the IDF can't overcome. But it is likely that they're going to use that time in order to reposition themselves and make it that much harder for the IDF as it comes to the next stage of the war, whatever that may be, looking likely like the IDF is going to invade southern parts of the Gaza Strip. You know, Alan, and I do want you to elaborate a little bit about where you think this war is going in just a moment. But first, I know that you were saying that you overlooked some of the list of the hostages that are going to be exchanged on Friday. Any chance that you saw any American hostages? I believe there's still reports that three of them are being held by Hamas currently. So I'll, I'll correct that. Um, I overlooked the list that was published was Israel's list of Palestinian prisoners that Israel approved in the government that could be released. Hamas has not released any list of the hostages that are going to be released, the Israeli hostages. The list that is public is the Palestinian prisoners that the Israeli government went through this very painstaking motion of approving each one, and they've published the list of Palestinian prisoners. In terms of the hostages that are being held by Hamas, there are several American citizens. The reports indicated that at least three who are American citizens might be released. The reason is they fit the criteria, so to speak. The criteria is children, and as far as the deal is concerned, children is anyone under the age of 19, and their mothers and other women. So fitting that criterion, it is possible that three American citizens will be in the list. It is likely, um, but the but the names haven't been released. That was one of the things that torpedoed the deal tonight. Was that Hamas was supposed to transfer the list of names that were, of the people who were going to be released to Israel already the night before, i.e., on Wednesday night, and they failed to do so. So those names, unfortunately, are not publicized. It is likely that it's going to include three U.S. citizens. Um, but that list is not available. The only list that's available is a list of Palestinian prisoners that Israel has agreed to release from jail should the deal go forth. Definitely concerning, as you did mention before, the fact that Hamas has not released their list and only going to cause further delay if we don't get that list soon. So we will be on the lookout for that. I do, Alan, want to ask, because this is the first time that we've had you on our programming, but it's nearly day 50 of this war between Israel and Hamas. So where do you see this war going from here? Any changes in tactics or strategy after we see what happens on Friday? It's a big question. Um, Israel has indicated that it's turning its sights towards the southern parts of the Gaza Strip. At first, it invaded the northern parts of the Gaza Strip. It called on all Palestinian civilians in the north to move down south. And... 1.7 million Palestinians are now internally displaced in the Gaza Strip. And right now, Israel is purging the north of the Hamas infrastructure. It is every day engaged in confrontation with Hamas fighters. And it is really going outpost by outpost, 
headquarters by headquarters, tunnel by tunnel, in order to try to, quote unquote, purify the north of Hamas. There is still a large contingent of Hamas, including the leadership that has fled down south. Israel has openly said that the war, as far as they're concerned, is not going to end until all of Hamas is destroyed. That means also going down south. The United States has expressed concern about this and has already said that before Israel turns its sights down south, it expects Israel to answer for the humanitarian situation. Israel has called on all Palestinian civilians to move down south. It has said that they cannot go north, even if the fighting goes south. Where do you want them to go? Israel has designated a small area in the eastern part of the southern Gaza Strip called the Mwasi area. That is supposed to be a clean area, a green zone that Israel will not attack. It cannot really house 2 million people. And there's growing concern over how will Israel carry out the next stage of the war in the southern parts of the Gaza Strip. In terms of where the war is going in the future, I will say I get asked a lot, um, can Israel destroy Hamas? And I said it really depends by what we mean destroy. Hamas is an entire government. It includes every mail delivery person, every police officer. So does it mean killing everyone who was ever salaried by Hamas or killing anyone who believed in the Hamas idea, killing every school teacher, arresting everyone? It really depends on what we say we mean by destroying Hamas. I think that what Israel wants to do is depose any Hamas administration, any Hamas government, try to confiscate all weaponry and kill as many Hamas operatives that are fighting units as they can. Then, to be perfectly honest, I am not sure that Israel actually has a plan for what happens the day after. And this is because I actually put out a summary every day on what's happening in the war and then includes political analyses of like what the different politicians are saying. And the EU and the United States and the UN have all called on Israel to reinstate, reinstate the, uh, the Palestinian Authority in the Gaza Strip, to have a revitalized Palestinian Authority that will take over the Gaza Strip. Meanwhile, in Israel's political establishment, you have ministers in government who are officially calling on Israel to expel all Palestinians from the Gaza Strip and rebuild settlements. You have ministers in government who are saying that Israel should simply occupy the Gaza Strip and rebuild settlements without expelling Palestinians. You have the prime minister who says that you're not going to expel Palestinians, but that Israel is going to have complete security control over the Gaza Strip, but that Israel is not going to govern the Gaza Strip. Then you have other people, primarily in opposition, saying Israel should in fact reinstate the Palestinian Authority, and um, strive for a two-state solution. So I think, to some extent, that is a recipe for disaster if Israel does not have a plan. At the same time, if we want to be optimistic, we can say that that is a good opportunity because it's unclear what exactly is going to happen, and it's a possibility for things to change in a more positive way towards some sort of resolution of this conflict. There's a lot of different ideas, possibly having a, a joint um, Egyptian, Saudi, Jordanian government that will take over, possibly having the UN take over. There's a lot of different ideas. I don't think Israel has actually thought about what is going to be the governance after it finishes in the Gaza Strip, but I do think that it is not to tend to finish in the Gaza Strip until it also moves down south and at least returns as many hostages as it can return, but primarily uproots any ability for Hamas to continue to govern the Gaza Strip as it did. Alan, I am glad that you brought up that point about this idea of eradicating Hamas. And when we talk about fighting against a terrorist organization, it's a conversation that we've had with a few other experts. When you think a terrorist organization, it's an ideology, more so than fighting a country with a set war, a set barrier, you know, Hamas, terrorists, that idea. It infiltrates so many different sectors of so many different places, and it is a very difficult moving forward with that. Dr. Alan Burstein, a visiting professor, excuse me, from the University of California, Irvine, specializing in political science. We appreciate your time here at Live Now from Fox, a great overview breakdown. We're looking ahead to Friday, see how all of this negotiation plays out, and we will be more than happy to have you again to continue to discuss the ongoing efforts amid this war.